Welcome back to Those Happy Places, the podcast that treats theme parks, rides, and attractions like literature. I'm Buddy Duquesne. And I'm Alice White. And Alice, it is time. It is time. We must discuss the elephant in the room, or should we say the mouse in the room? Yes, I think it is time after 20 some odd episodes of the show. I think we finally reached the moment where we have to talk about dear, sweet Mickey Mouse. Mickey the Mortimer Mouse, um, (laughs) as he is called. (laughs) That can't be his middle name. Um, Mickey Timothy Mouse, um, (laughs) as he is called. uh, The the lead mascot of the Walt Disney Company and the perhaps most famous walk-around character at any theme park in the world. I'm going to pause it that Mickey Mouse might be the most iconic, most famous animated character in the world. I might agree with you there. I think there might be some very strong contenders elsewhere in media, but when you think about Mickey Mouse, Mickey has the um, the strong advantage of being an icon. Uh, quite literally, like a flat piece of art that is is easy to put on things right mickey's head is three circles one big two smaller for the ears like mickey has this this omnipresence because of his ability to be that icon and to be on things that mickey is maybe one of the most famous symbols of all time too and i think that's what we're going to need to talk about today is this idea of mickey mouse as a symbol or as a, uh, in, to put it in literary terms, as a signifier, right? This uh, thing that represents another thing. And Mickey really is that for the Walt Disney Company. Yeah, he is the, the he is so much so that for the Disney Company that uh, oftentimes when people say that they work for the Disney Company, the shorthand for that is, I work for the mouse. Or the I'm mouse. going. I'm going to go visit the mouse. Or, um, or as, um, as we say, when we refer to the Orlando airport, um, the Orlando airport code is MCO, and it's uh, named after somebody. It, it doesn't actually mean mean this, but we we refer to it as Mickey's corporate office uh, because Orlando, the city of Orlando, and uh, Mickey's importance to the Disney company in the city of Orlando to us when we land in MCO airport to us we are visiting Mickey we're not just visiting and Disney we are visiting Mickey like Mickey's Mickey's symbology is everywhere he's um, he's the source of the hats uh, that Disneyland uh, so so joyfully will um, remix and, and resell um Though recently the mini headbands have been a bigger draw, and I think that's simply because the hats are kind of doofy looking and the headbands look way cooler. Yeah, um, you can fit fit the the headbands over almost any hairstyle, whereas hats yeah. are pretty limiting. Right. Um, and and so Mickey's on the hats. Um, Mickey is in Disneyland. He lives there. He's got his movie barn. Um, his his likeness, that three circle symbol, is on every single ride. As a, oh yeah, a hidden, the hidden Mickeys. Hidden Mickeys. Uh, Mickey, Mickey really is the the Disney original. Really, the the thing that catapulted the Disney company from a kind of um, backyard movie barn, as it were, to international fame. Like Mickey was the beginning of all of those things. So the the fame is not unearned, right? Mickey Mickey as a uh, larger symbol for the company makes sense, kind he's of on been, a timeline thing. He's had the opportunity to become the symbol and and ingrain himself into the whole world's minds for ninety years now. Is this his ninetieth yeah, birthday? He celebrated his ninetieth birthday back in uh, I think it was November, right? Yeah, and um, and so. 90 entire years several generations of people have seen this likeness and this image and those adorable ears over and over and over and over again and as the Disney company has purchased other studios and other properties and and, uh, acquired other things that, that are prominent in pop culture like Marvel and Lucasfilm and Pixar 
Um, the mouse and Mickey's likeness have kind of taken over so many aspects of so many people's lives. You're right. And and I remember uh, when when Disney bought Lucasfilm that uh, there were there were lots of and, and these images existed before because of the Disney's uh, or the Disney because of Disney's um, partnership with Lucasfilm in a lot of ways in the theme parks and things like that. Um, but I remember seeing a lot more images of Mickey uh, dressed as a Jedi and yes. like and like the way that Mickey like kind of just slid into the Star Wars universe and Mickey became a Jedi and Donald was dressed as a stormtrooper and Goofy's dressed as Darth Vader with his pants down for some reason and, and heart underwear. Um, <laughs> it's goofy. It's goofy. So like like Mickey Mickey truly when that happened, that was such a fitting image for like. Disney is Star Wars now and Star Wars is Disney and Mickey being in a Jedi costume kind of is perfectly representational of that. And that's the thing that I think we need to focus on about Mickey. And here's my main thesis statement for this episode, Alice, is that Mickey is a symbol, a signifier without any particular context. He is what we might call an empty signifier no signified uh, morality, no signified character traits. He simply represents, at this point, he's a stamp, kind of, for the company. He has one big thing that he symbolizes, right? The Walt Disney Company. But D Mickey, as a character himself, is kind of nebulous. He doesn't really have... A, a defined set of character traits. And we were talking about this before we started the episode. But who is Mickey Mouse? That's a, a really good question. And it is, it's easy to throw around generic adjectives to describe Mickey Mouse. You could say, oh, he's, you know, he's joyful and he's sweet and he's uh, positive and he's happy. And he's, you know, you could say these like, you know, these personality traits that we've ascribed to Mickey, but those personality traits, most of them haven't always really been true. If we cast ourselves back to like the original, um, original Mickey cartoons, 90 whole years ago, um, Mickey was kind of, um, he was kind of like a mischievous little, uh, little mouse. He was, yeah. uh, he was. He, he really. He very much in, embodied the trickster archetype, right? He was. He was a smaller, not as strong guy. That's why Pete was such a good foil for him, um, because Pete was bigger and stronger. But where Mickey ex excelled was in being clever, right? He wasn't so, just clever. He was tricky, and he was cunning and he was uh you know kind of mean sometimes like getting back at the big strong bully um but like he would do things like deliberately humiliating or um or hurtful to those who were his foils yeah and and he he i mean if we look at steamboat willie you know he he's vengeful he he takes he takes action that you know pete wrongs him pete like uh, takes away the steamboat and and throws him in the brig and makes him peel potatoes and then <laughs> and then steals Minnie on like a crane. I think that's how Steamboat Willie goes. Yeah. Um. And and Mickey Mickey beats the the living crap out of him. Alice like <laughs> Pete ends up in a furnace, my dude. <laughs> it's and not yeah, good for him. Sure. And it's a cartoon and it's going to be overblown and it's going to be silly, but. Um, but that was the original version of Mickey that was ever put out into the world was he was this like plucky little underdog who would kind of do whatever it took to save his girl or to get back at, at the bad guys. And there was um, there was nothing there. There was less of that that joyful, peace loving, you know, like happy, happy Mickey that we kind of know now in that. It's, yeah, and I, I think a lot of that comes from the, the purpose of cartoons at the time, right? Where where cartoons were not just for kids. They weren't uh, trying to teach a moral or a lesson. They were trying to be fun entertainment for all audiences to, to play between longer uh, events, you know, bigger films, new newsreels, and things like that. Cartoons were uh, pure entertainment for all 
So that meant that there was a little less emphasis on being friendly and marketable and a little more emphasis on like a fun or funny image. And right. I think that's what Mickey's early work really, really shows. And it's funny, I should say Mickey or Mickey's early work because soon we'll be talking about him as filmmaker. Right. Um, it's also like we're talking about him like he's not just the extension of the little literal arm of Walt Disney. This is Walt Disney as a, as a man, as an inventor, a creator and a writer giving this, you know, this character of his, um, you know, a various you know, plots to work through, like the idea of an adorable little mouse being the great hero of a rescue story and, and playing with these ideas to, to entertain people. It's Walt yeah. Disney. And and that's the thing about, um, about looking that far back, I think, is that, you know, Mickey's just a, a pretty good idea from back then um that that really succeeded because of like technological leaps like steamboat willie being the first sound cartoon um so that that really made mickey stand out from the rest of the pack but he's a lot like other rubber hose animation of the time i mean i'm specifically reminded of popeye with popeye being smaller and pluckier and perhaps a bit more clever than the bigger stronger bluto right it's like that same dynamic right um and right down to Minnie Mouse and olive oil kind of resembling each other a little bit, too, with the speaking shape of their and, dresses. And speaking in nothing but loud squeaks and squawks and yeah. help, help, you know, like <laughs> exactly. that. Exactly. <laughs> uh, so, so, you know, that's early Mickey. But I, I actually think that as the Disney company got bigger and started to become more successful and more critically acclaimed, Mickey got softer a lot faster um, than we might expect. Uh, for example, Alice, did you know that Fantasia was made in 1940? 1940. 40. I, no, I had no idea. I thought Fantasia it was... Fantasia is a pre-war animated piece. I uh, thought it was post... I thought for sure it was from the 50s. Are you serious? Seriously. And, and in Fantasia, Mickey makes maybe his second most iconic appearance outside of Steamboat Willie. Maybe his most iconic appearance, honestly, because, uh, you know, we've been riding the Sorcerer's Apprentice as far as iconography goes in Disneyland since 1940. Yeah, the um, Sorcerer's Apprentice Mickey in his red robe and his blue hat is is almost as prevalent in like Mickey imagery on like shirts and 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 merch and stuff um, as as like just typical red shorts with yellow buttons you know, with the white gloves, Mickey, like that's the, like, I think those are the, the two Mickeys that we see the most often. Right. And, and, and Sorcerer's Apprentice Mickey is, I think he's kind of a different character. He's definitely a different character from Steamboat Willie. He's way different from Steamboat Willie. He's, but he's different from what we might expect Mickey to be period. And I think this is the beginning of an interesting trend actually. Right. Uh, and Sorcerer's Apprentice, he's kind of like, meek and quiet but curious and um and then you know gets in over his head with all the 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 magic and finds you know the the power inside of him all along but you know then go you know goes back to to being yeah he's the the sorcerer's apprentice he's not the sorcerer he's just the mouse that helps yeah. out he he learns a lesson at the end, and that lesson is don't reach too far because <laughs> you can't handle this. Um, and and the sorcerer whose canon name is Yen Sid, which yes is Disney backwards. Um, Goodness gracious! Is is such a such a fun character, such a fun foil to Mickey because he's kind of a tricky guy on his own. He he kind of knows that if he leaves Mickey alone with the hat, that like this is gonna happen. So, you know, kind of turning it around on Mickey, letting him make a mistake and then kind of waggling your finger at him being like, no, no, don't do that again. Uh, and then Mickey kind of accepting that that doesn't feel like Steamboat Willie. That doesn't feel like early Mickey at all. And, and Mickey had reached a really modern design at that point. Like early Mickey, we think of as kind of black and white, you know, uh, his face being kind of not tan but at that point he's tan and rounder and his snout has shortened and he looks more cheerful so so mickey had kind of reached what we what we picture in our heads which is why i think sorcerer's apprentice is so enduring as an image because mickey hasn't changed fundamentally as like an iconic character since about then i think like as far as his design goes 
Right. His design. Yeah. The design of, of Mickey and his like rounder, more cuter face with his bigger eyes and everything to turn him a little um, like a little more childlike in appearance um, with his kind of thicker, um, thicker limbs, even like he's not so like you described earlier that like rubber hose um, look of Steamboat Willie. Yeah. Um, he's not so skinny and scrawny and, and scrappy anymore. He's cuddly and cute and um and sweeter yeah he's he's more of a friend than a, a, an antagonist almost i guess i would say i mean mickey's our protagonist but i guess that's what i mean mickey doesn't antagonize he doesn't protagonize either he just kind of is your friend he's yeah, a friend he's a buddy um and i think that's really interesting when you compare him to perhaps the rest of the fab five who over the course of the next you know, couple of years would maybe play a bigger role in animation. Uh, for example, Donald would literally go to war. Um, he was drafted into the Navy and and officially at the end of the war, given an honorable discharge. Um, but he he would, you know, make a bunch of propaganda cartoons because Donald is a sailor, first and foremost. And he's easily angered and kind of aggressive. And Donald hasn't changed that much since then. Uh, in fact, Donald has even had kind of a return to form, uh, a more pure form of like easily angered, but kind hearted guy um, in like the most recent DuckTales reboot. Right. Where where you can see the Donald of 1940 is basically Donald of now, whereas Mickey of 1940 is kind of whatever he's he's kind of about the same i guess but mickey of 1940 isn't as well defined as early mickey right he kind of um by by putting him by casting him in the sorcerer's apprentice which they didn't have to do um they could have made the the apprentice character just like a little boy but they made a mickey mouse but by being able to cast mickey in the sorcerer's apprentice or in other cartoons like that uh, mickey kind of becomes uh, a blank slate character that you can put other characters' personalities on. You can put him in the Prince and the Popper, and you can put him in um, in uh, the Christmas Carol. You can put him in in pretty much anything, and it's just oh, that's Mickey Mouse. The only thing that like sets him apart as being Mickey Mouse is the look, is the design. Um, yeah, and, but, and perhaps maybe his voice, right? Yeah, but, like Mickey, Mickey's greatest strength since Sorcerer's Apprentice and maybe even a little bit before and a little bit after again this is not an exhaustive documentation of the history of Mickey but I think it, it Sorcerer's Apprentice is a great example of how you can just put Mickey wherever you want and he can kind of embody whatever you need in the moment it works best if he's embodying something positive um, if he's embodying uh, something that portrays the company in a good way but Mickey's kind of do whatever you want with him. He's he's kind of a, a free agent as far as personality goes. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. He's never a, he's never going to be a villain character, but he could be your you know your plucky little hero, or he could be like in um like I'll go back to like Mickey in the Christmas Carol for for example. He's just like the down on his luck. You know, um, the guy that works for Scrooge. What's a what's his name? Um, uh, Mr. Cratchit. Bob Cratchit. Bob Cratchit. He gets to be Bob, Bob Cratchit, um, which is, you know, a good spot for him because he's not uh, the bad guy at all. But he's he's not um, fighting, you know, fighting villains or sword fighting. And, and he's not casting spells like in The Sorcerer's Apprentice. He's just kind of like, oh, well, I guess I'll just go home to my family and uh, and take care of Tiny Tim. You know, it's it's he's it's just Mickey. And and this idea of Mickey as this like as the blank slate of animation of being able to just kind of throw Mickey into whatever character you need him to be um, is directly tied to um, we've and we've talked about this before in our Toontown episode um, Mickey as the actor um, yeah Mickey Mickey as part of the film industry Mickey um, is part of the film industry because he's been cast in so many roles and played so many characters and had so many different personalities it made like a lot of sense for them to um, for him to have a film studio in his backyard like he yeah. in, in, in canon in 
actual Mickey lore, he's got this film barn in his backyard that where where he makes all of his films and he's directing and starring and producing and writing and making music for it and everything. He's got the entire production in his on his property because Mickey isn't just, oh, look at this cute little mouse anymore. Mickey is the Walt Disney Studio. In, and in many ways, as we said in that episode, Mickey is Walt. Like he's he's a yes. proxy for Walt's uh, Walt's personal journey. Uh, so so casting him as right next to Walt the whole way. Um, the two statues at the California resorts are Mickey and Walt uh, looking out over Disneyland and mm-hmm. Mickey and Walt arriving in Hollywood at California Adventure. Right, um, young and, and not on a pedestal, and with their arms around each other, like looking for adventure. Yeah, kind they're, of thing. they're gonna they're gonna find their way. But you know, Mickey and Walt intertwined as part of the Disney mythology uh, is a really important, I think, a really easy way to understand why Mickey might not have as clear a um, as clear a, a character as maybe we would expect for how popular and ubiquitous he is. Alice, I'm reminded because uh, it is February 5th, 2019, as we record this, isn't it? It is. Uh, I'm reminded that uh, just a few days ago, Kingdom Hearts 3 came out. And this is not a Kingdom Hearts podcast, though. I think (laughs) I think honestly, we should have an episode on Kingdom Hearts eventually. Um, And I have not played the third game. Um, But Mickey in the Kingdom Hearts series is really interesting. Um, He is the king of the Disney world. So there's <laughs> there's a world where the Disney characters and by the Disney characters I mean the non uh oh wow this is actually really hard to describe. I mean the Fab 5 and their attachments. So Goofy and Donald and Pluto and Mickey and Minnie and Daisy and Pete uh and you know Huey Dewey and Louie and Uncle Scrooge like they live in one world all together. It's the the residents of who I would think of as the residents of Mickey's Toontown in Disneyland. Yeah. Like, like not necessarily like Roger Rabbit and co, but anybody that would run around that part of the park. Yeah. Chip and Dale are from the same world too. Uh, so, so almost exactly the residents of Toontown. Uh, so Mickey is their King. Uh, everybody is deferential to Mickey And Mickey spends most of the series absent from the adventure and only shows up in really uh, important moments because he's on his own journey of discovery in the background where he studied under the great Keyblade master, Yen Sid, who taught him magic (laughs) and how to kill Heartless with a Keyblade. And I, I kid you not, Alice, there is a moment in Kingdom Hearts 2, and this is not a spoiler because later it gets played for laughs, but I guess if you are concerned about the um story of kingdom hearts 2 and want to be completely surprised you should fast forward 30 seconds because we're going to laugh about this for 30 seconds exactly um okay. where goofy dies oh my god <laughs> well <laughs> uh he doesn't actually die he gets hit with a rock and seems dead uh and mickey who shows up in a in a dark cloak wielding his keyblade throws off his cloak behind him and says into the camera with the angriest expression on his face ever. He says, they'll pay for this. And then he rushes off into the horde of bad guys that, that presumably killed Goofy. (laughs) And he takes his vengeful wrath out on them. Oh my God. I know. And like like that, that's a moment. And you're like, wow, how un, un in character for Mickey Mouse. Um, but actually no, like I, it, it honestly in that moment when you're playing the game and it, it happens, uh, you don't think to yourself like, whoa, Mickey would never or should never. You think like, oh, yeah, King Mickey totally would be mad that his best pal got hit with a rock like he's going to he's going to get upset and it works. Um, <laughs> it's it's super weird that I, I've been having this interaction with this other Mickey. This this Mickey that has this completely other explanation for who he is, this other backstory uh, this thing unattached from much of the Walt Disney Company's mythology and self-aggrandizement and self-storytelling. Uh, there's this other Mickey out there, and he's extremely popular. Um, he's extremely popular specifically in this video game. 
And and I'm I'm just not sure like why that would feel so natural outside of this whole Mickey can be whatever you want him to be. He can he can be a fighter. He can he can be your friend. I mean, Alice, do you do you have any specific um interactions with Mickey that you remember from maybe like earlier in your in your childhood or uh, maybe later as you started to grow up? Like meeting Mickey Mouse like at the park or maybe maybe meeting Mickey at the park or, you know, interactions with Mickey media, because I think another part of what we're going for here is that Mickey doesn't have a lot of stuff where he's represented at all lately. Yeah, that's that's right. We I remember meeting Mickey at Mickey's house. I remember being excited to meet Mickey at Mickey's house, mostly, I think, because um going through the house and everything's such a big deal and they make like this really huge deal about getting to meet mickey and not knowing you know what costume he'd be wearing and and everything before you walked in if oh am i gonna meet steamboat willie am i gonna meet the sorcerer's apprentice like i don't know um but they were all like older you know or like a like um when he's the band leader in the um the bandstand oh yeah absolutely mickey's bandstand i think it's called and I, and the, but they're all like older cartoons. I don't remember as a kid um, having any like new Mickey media to look forward to that made that character like really special to me. Like as like as a kid, it was yeah. all I'm watching these cartoons that my parents watched. I'm watching these cartoons that my grandparents watched, and. Um, and they're cute and good and I like them and I like Mickey. He's so adorable. Gives great hugs. Um, <laughs> 10 out of 10 and, gives great hugs. Great hugs, you know, and I have I have so many pictures with him. Um, but. Um, no, other than like a like a Mickey hat by getting a Mickey hat to wear at the at the park. Um, like Mickey's not like that special or important to me yeah he's this he's just a a symbol of this place i like disneyland yeah i i know that recently there have been mickey cartoons um shorts animated shorts that uh they have their own look um we used a, a screen capture of one of them on our uh title card for this episode so if you haven't seen the new look that's what it looks like um and Mickey and Minnie and Donald and Goofy all look pretty iconic and good. Um, but, you know, I also have watched them and they're they're like oddly subversive. They're they're kind of like, this isn't your dad's Mickey cartoon, <laughs> um, which is weird because Mickey cartoons were always kind of subversive. Right. He he always played tricks and was a little a little aggressive back in the day. So, like, you can tell that they're kind of trying to take inspiration from that. But it feels odd knowing what we know now about what Mickey would become, I guess. It doesn't feel like proper Mickey. It feels like a like a Mickey spinoff, which is so funny because it really is the truest Mickey representation we've seen in a long time. Um, And Alice, before the episode, we were talking a little bit about some other Mickey cartoons that were perhaps more recent but aren't running right now. Uh, There was... Mickey Mouse Clubhouse, I guess, which was for which was, babies. Yeah, it's a baby show teaching little little kids about like math and colors and stuff. Yeah. Adorable, and you just use these like cute little, you know, mice and and ducks and dogs to teach kids how to read. Like that's yeah. that's cute and precious. Um, but yeah, and then I I remembered um, uh, Mickey's uh, House of Mouse. Oh yeah, the House was- of Mouse. House of Mouse was a cartoon that ran for a while when we were we we were at kind of a weird age for it, I think. But there was, you know, the whole generation of kids that grew up that that was their Mickey. And in that um, Mickey's Mickey's not really I mean, he wears a suit a lot. <laughs> Mickey, I, I the way that I see House of Mouse Mickey and this was, you know, for for a for a cartoon that was focused on. Mickey and the Fab Five, and then all of your other favorite Disney characters. Um, But specifically like the, the, um, the like B plot of every character involved Mickey Mouse or or B plot of every episode involved Mickey Mouse. Um, He was like the dad of the group. Yeah. He's like responsible and, and sensible and he's a business owner. (laughs) 
Yeah, he wears suits and he runs the uh, the club and he invites the guests. And when something goes wrong and they can't find such and such or so and so, like Mickey's the guy to bring in to fix the problem. And he's not like, I'm so happy all the time. And isn't this so fun? Like he gets, you know, like stressed out and worried about his friends. And he, and he gets you know, like, like exasperated and like and he, like he works too hard and he, he gets frustrated with situations. He's, he's the dad. He's, he's, he's the, the dad. dad. Of the <laughs> Um, and and that's cute, but it's just like a whole different Mickey, one that I think at the time felt like his own age. Like that was yeah, he was you know, he was whatever about seventy. He was like seventy years old and acted like it yeah. when that show was on. You know, kind of a, kind of an older established guy, and and the the idea of House of Mouse really just reminds me of Disneyland. Like it's a place where all the Disney characters can hang out and and be together. And not be violent or in conflict, but also they are themselves, kind of like what we talked about in the Toontown episode. But Mickey is just a vehicle for facilitating that um, rather than being a participant, being his own thing. Yeah, I want to throw back really quick. I just kind of had a a weird thought and you can tell me if this is if this goes anywhere. Okay, hit me. I want to run back to the Sorcerer's Apprentice really fast. Okay. And the fact that I know now that The Sorcerer's Apprentice came out in 1940, when I thought it came out much, much later. To know that it came out, you know, a good 20 some odd years, even before Walt Disney passed away, um, as an as an allegory for Mickey Mouse becoming the face of the Disney company. When... You know, they couldn't have been thinking about this when they made it, but even the fact that the sorcerer was named what what is what was it again? Yen Sid. Yen Sid, and it's Disney backwards. If Dis if Walt Disney, Mr. Walt himself, is Yen Sid and Mickey Mouse is his apprentice that is ex- you know, experimenting with magic or whatever, but is his apprentice going to be his replacement as the like head of the symbol of the Disney company? And is maybe, you know, a little shy and a little meek, but kind of curious. And then eventually after Walt's passing, um, none of nobody else, no other CEO of the Walt Disney Company has had quite the um, the same like face recognition and, you know, personality. Like we, we know their names, you know, Eisner and Iger and all of these guys. We we know who runs the Disney Company, but nobody has been as iconic visually as Walt. And that maybe... Mickey as the apprentice of the sorcerer was being primed the whole time to take over for Walt uh, as the as as the sorcerer as the one who runs the place. What do you think? Well, Alice, I have um, two answers for you here. Okay. Um, answer number one: I think you're really onto something. I think that it's way too big of a coincidence to be um, not worth at least some merit as a thought experiment, like. Is this a, a cool moment where we're kind of acknowledging that what will outlast us are the symbols we create? I think that's really great. I think I think you're incredibly smart and great for bringing that up because I didn't get there. Oh, thanks, bud. <laughs> uh, I, answer number two, you really should have said that in my office. We should have had an aside about that. I feel oh, like we shouldn't shoot. have said I, that out in the open. That was like a really smart said, idea. <laughs> said that out here where just anybody can hear us. Disney, that's not free. That's not free, guys. <laughs> <laughs> like, if you want us to write a story about how that's true, you can contact us at thosehappyplaces at gmail.com. Uh, yes. So, yes, I, I definitely think that's, that's super smart. Uh, it's really kind of a perfect allegory for what for what disney is um and what disney has become because really what is bigger than a person what is bigger than a person's creations it's like the The like legacy they leave the legacy they leave and then the things that they create after that the legacy that that is even bigger than the legacy and mickey for all of the faults that we're kind of pointing out all of the the kind of random places that mickey can be and all of the random things that he can he can kind of represent he is so much bigger than a character um right i'm reminded of uh bugs bunny and we were talking a little bit about bugs bunny uh before we started the episode but bugs bunny is a character that is easily as old as mickey perhaps older i'm not actually sure um, but about, you know, a contemporary of Mickey created around the same time. 
Um, and in that scene in Who Framed Roger Rabbit, they uh, are both falling through the sky and they, they have that great scene on, on screen together. And it's like super crazy that they would ever be on screen because they're these two titans of animated comedy and these two symbols of larger companies. I mean, Bugs is the face of Warner Brothers in, in some Warner Brothers cinematic logos. Bugs pops out and eats a carrot, right? Like, right. it's like, dun, 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 and he takes the bite. Right. Yeah. So like Bugs is Warner Brothers is the Looney Tunes. Mickey is Disney. However, Bugs is a character. Bugs has a, a very distinct personality. And maybe even more than Mickey, Bugs has been placed in uh, hundreds of situations where he's kind of playing another character. I've seen him play a knight. I've seen him play a space cadet. I've seen him play Robin Hood. Uh, I've seen him play a guy in a spooky castle. I've seen him be in a Western. Like, Bugs can go anywhere, but he's always Bugs. Right. And he Mickey doesn't... isn't always Mickey. No, Mickey is sometimes... And I'll just throw back uh, again to... I, I referred to, to Mickey and the, the Prince and the Popper mm. earlier. Do you remember that animated That's movie? That's two where Mickeys. It's two Mickeys with two very distinct personalities in the same movie. And they're both believable as Mickey. Bugs Bunny does not do that. No, Bugs is Bugs. Uh, Bugs and, is and just Bugs. Will always be Bugs. In modern, Even when Bugs is Robin Hood, Bugs, Bugs is, Bugs. is Bugs. Bugs. Yeah, in modern uh, Warner Brothers cartoons, Looney Tunes remakes, uh, Bugs is the same guy. He's got the same voice. He does the same things. He eats the carrot. He tricks you. He says, what's up, Doc? He's smarter than whoever he's pitted against. He's Bugs. Bugs is always Bugs. And Mickey is so often depicted in not in duplicate, but in like multiplicity, like Mickey is always depicted as Steamboat Willie and the Sorcerer's Apprentice and Jack the Giant Slayer and uh, the bandstand leader and modern Mickey. And and you can get car- you can get T-shirts that have all of those versions of Mickey. But Bugs like, is like, like lined up in a lineup. Basically. Yeah. And you, you can kind of see the history of Mickey kind of unfold. But Bugs is like singular. He's just Bugs. He's gone through changes like he's been he's been drawn differently, but he's always the same archetype, the same trickster archetype. Uh, And I wonder if that makes him like weaker as a symbol or if it makes him stronger as a character, because like at least there's a character that endures, but it's not really a, a character. It's kind of a like I said, like an archetype. It's like a kind of a character. It, it's a yeah. gesture at a character. I think he he might be stronger as a as a uh, I think you got it. I think he's stronger as a character, but therefore maybe weaker weaker as a symbol, as an icon. I think Mickey's adaptability and the and like that blank slatedness of of Mickey of Mickey Mouse makes him more um He's he's more able to serve as an icon for several different aspects of Disney. Because Bugs really can only do Warner Brothers uh, when Warner Brothers is doing Looney Tunes. Warner Brothers makes the Harry Potter movies, and Bugs isn't popping out of the Warner Brothers logo at the beginning really, of all really the Harry Potter movies. Out of the Sorting Hat, though, I mean, giant missed opportunity. <laughs> it would have been very funny. Um, but Mickey can wear a Jedi robe or. Um, or be you know run a, a a clubhouse or you know there's a lot of things that Mickey Mouse can do um, that uh, with his adaptable personality and his kind of like like movable parts. Um, whereas Bugs is just like sarcastic and kind of rude and um, and does that very funny thing where he stands very still. Why, while he's making fun of someone. I don't know why that is so funny to me every <laughs> every time I watch it, but he just like looks somebody dead in the eye and just like, just makes fun of them to their face. And that's very, <laughs> very funny. Um, I love, I love a Bugs. Um, but I think, yeah, that kind of character is, is cute and, um, and like visually people go, oh yeah, that's Bugs Bunny. Um, but he cannot represent Warner Brothers as a whole the way Mickey can represent Disney as a whole. Absolutely. And and it's funny because Bugs is also a popular theme park franchise's walk around character. He he belongs to the Six Flags of the world. 
Um, yeah. Not to mention the Warner Brothers world in Dubai. Like he he is an icon in his own right at theme parks as well. But I feel like people aren't lining up at Bugs's house. Like Bugs <laughs> no. isn't part of the story of Six Flags. And by being completely untethered from the places where he's represented, I think Bugs doesn't even serve that purpose as strongly as Mickey does either. Um, maybe maybe another interesting example would be Snoopy and the Peanuts at Knott's Berry Farm and the rest of the uh, Cedar Fair theme parks. Like, sure. Snoopy's a, an iconic character that a lot of people know. Snoopy's great, and he's pretty malleable. He's a, uh, sometimes he's a writer uh, on his doghouse. He's on a dark and stormy night, and he's typing on his typewriter. Sometimes he's the Red Baron. He's the Red Baron. Or no, he's a World War One flying ace who is chasing the Red Baron. Who's chasing the Red Baron. That's right, sorry. Uh, um, he's he's many things, and in, in the animated... Um, uh, specials he's he's like you know he's he's sometimes a pilgrim and sometimes he's Santa Claus or whatever like he, he can dress up and have a good time but he's always kind of Snoopy the dog you know right and I wonder if that comes from, from if if you take Bugs for um, Six Flags and Snoopy for Knots um, the fact that those characters were developed so separately and then adopted by these um these theme parks. Oh yeah, they're not, like, they weren't even uh, developed for the same medium, right? Like not at all. Whereas Disneyland was built like with Mickey Mouse, like in mind, right? Like they yeah, Knott's Mickey Berry was Farm, there on opening day. Yeah, it's it, there's they are uh, they are more married in concept than I mean Snoopy's awesome, but he had nothing to do with Knott's Berry Farm until Cedar Fair was like. Yeah, we'll take them. <laughs> yeah, and then they built they built Camp Snoopy, and and that whole thing kind of took off. Um, but it's it still feels like an addendum. It feels like well, Disneyland has has Mickey, so we got to have something. Oh, here right. here here's Snoopy and the Peanut Gang. Like that'll be fun. Um, and and I think that's maybe the the big thing to take away from this is that where where Disney benefits from this whole thing is kind of the vertical integration of being this huge entertainment company with dozens and hundreds of properties that they can use uh, and also having this uh, vertically integrated symbol of themselves who is also a character in his own right and can can walk around and talk and represent quite physically Alice at his 90th birthday. He was there and he, yeah. he did performances and was dressed in his 90th birthday best which was like a velvet sports coat. It was an odd choice. Um, <laughs> and and he, he is Mickey Mouse. Like, people aren't lining up for Bugs Bunny's 90th birthday party, but that's also because Disney owns ABC and can dedicate two hours during prime time to Mickey's birthday party. And so, <laughs> and so the strength just becomes more strength. And mickey's strength as a symbol is tied to the strength of disney as a company and like you say as he becomes part of other properties when they bought marvel he was dressed in a spider-man costume i think um and things I'm like sure that he's done that <laughs> yeah mickey can be anyone and disney can also become anyone and if that sounds a little sinister maybe it is but it's also why mickey's such an enduring symbol i think yeah. And yeah, and I think um, to go back to the title of the episode in your original thesis is why it's uh, it, important that he remains kind of an, an empty signifier. This yeah. like this blank slate, like non-entity, like it's just a symbol on his own that can be morphed and changed and turned into so many different things. That's important for the Disney brand. It might, yeah, you're right. It might be cynical to look at it that way, or you know, um, uh, might be a little sinister, but it's important. I agree. Well, Alice, I think our conversation on Mickey as an empty signifier has come to an end. Well, it has come to end an end here on this podcast, but the conversation continues on the internet. <laughs> on the internet. On the internet, mostly on Twitter. Wow, uh, I'm at Buddy underscore Duquesne on Twitter. How do you spell Duquesne, Buddy? Uh, you can spell it D-U-Q-U-E-S-N-E because that's the way it's spelled. Yes, and uh, you can find me on Twitter at Alice White, T-H-P. Um, but even better, you can find this show on Twitter now at Happy Places Pod. 
Yeah, happy places pod. It's a great uh, account to follow if you want to stay up to date, specifically on those happy places news. Um, we retweet stuff that Alice and I say that is uh, relevant to those happy places. So you'll see all of our great content if you go follow that account as well. Yes. Um, and another thing that you'll find on that account is a link to our Patreon. Oh, are we on Patreon, Alice? We're on Patreon. Patreon Patreon.com slash those happy places is the address to go to if you like this show and you want to give us a little support. Yeah, um, there's all sorts of great backer rewards. We've got things like stickers and postcards and special Discord privileges, which, by the way, Alice, did you know we were on Discord? We are on Discord. If you need a link to our Discord, if you want to talk to us personally, one-on-one, in more than 280 characters at a time, Discord's the place to go. So find Discord us on, is on, the place. on Twitter or email us, and we can send you a link to join us. So we've got uh, Discord privileges. We've got uh, pre-show hangouts. We've got um, ooh, we've got screenings and watch parties of theme park-related things. Uh, and at any level, if you join us on our Patreon, you'll get mini-sodes, bonus mini-sodes. And we've got a lot of those fun uh, mini-sodes lined up for you guys. So make sure you go check it out. Patreon.com slash those happy places. Once again, that's patreon.com slash those happy places. Check us out. And if you have any questions, please feel free to reach out to us on Twitter. Again, that's at happy places pod. Alice, I think that I might add some music to this episode. Oh, really? Um, how about our theme music? Where'd you find that? Well, if they're listening to the episode right now, then our listeners are hearing Golden Gate by the California Feet Warmers, which is also featuring Phil Alvin. You can find the Feet Warmers at www.CaliforniaFeetWarmers.com. Yes, and you can find any additional music from this episode, uh, which uh, was composed by Kevin McLeod. And you can find all of that music at IncomTech.com. Kevin, IncomTech. So, IncomTech.com. Um, Kevin so graciously allows us to use music under a Creative Commons license. Um, because he is kind and generous and amazing. Yes. Um, Alice, I think that might be everything we need to cover. I think so, too. It's been a pleasure recording with you today. Thank you so much for recording this excellent episode with me. Uh, And to all of our listeners, thank you again, and we hope you return to those happy places.